we're going to talk about chill like Jesus. I was looking at some statistics, and did you know that in the last 3,400 years, only 268 of those years, think about it, 3,400 years, only 268 of those years are, are years of peace. All the other years have been warfare and strife. I was on the um, Council of Foreign Relations website, and they say right now that there are 25 wars. Right now, all over the world, 25 wars going on. And that's amazing because in spite of our quest for peace, our desire for peace, there is a warmongering mindset that's taken hold of humanity. We have a, we have a longing for peace, for marital peace, for global peace, peace between nations, peace of mind. Dave Ramsey's trying to help us to have financial peace. We're, we're looking for peace, and it seems like it's hard to find. Where, where can we find peace? But peace is not man's idea. It's not our, our idea. It's God's idea. From the beginning, one of my favorite places of Scripture is Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. This is how God is thinking of us, and He's thinking thoughts toward us, thoughts of peace. There's a prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6 that says, it's talking about Jesus coming, and it says that He will be the Prince of Peace. And it says, of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. So Jesus personifies peace. The eternal Son of God has come to earth. He came 2,000 years ago. Now He walks among us. He lives with us. And we can live the kind of life that emulates Christ. We can be people of peace. Jesus said this. He said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. That's not the kind of peace I'm talking about. Talk His peace is different. It's a peace that passes all understanding. Matter of fact, the angels announced the arrival of His birth and said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And so we've been longing and looking and hoping for peace, and yet it seems to elude us. Where can we Grab onto this. How can we tap into this? Isaiah 53, 5, it says that, the, speaking prophetically of him at the cross, it says that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So he took the shame. He took the, the torture. He took the uh, abuse. He was punished. He was bruised. He was wounded so that we could have peace, so that we can experience this peace. So let me say it this way. The solution to all human conflict begins and ends with Jesus. This is what we find in the Word of God. Let me give you a, an illustration. It's a story. It's in uh, Matthew's Gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew 8, Mark 4, and Luke 8 all tell the story of Jesus being with his disciples and they're in a ship in a sea. It was the Sea of Galilee. My wife and I had the privilege of going uh, to Israel not long ago and we were on the Sea of Galilee, and the one that was, uh, the, the tour guide told us that the Sea of Galilee is notorious for storms just popping up at any minute because of the, of the way the mountains are formed, and the, the wind flowing through the mountains creates a channel, and in, in any given moment, the Sea of Galilee can erupt in a storm. And so Jesus was with his disciples, and they were in a boat, and the storm uh, came upon the boat, and in the Sea of Galilee, they were, they were, they were so afraid these were seasoned sa sailors, seasoned fishermen, but this must have been a, a big storm. The waves were crashing on the boat into the boat. The Bible says that the boat was now filling with water, and they were so afraid. The Bible says they walked over to Jesus, they went over to Jesus, and Jesus, uh, I think it was in Mark's gospel, says that Jesus had a pillow, and he was sleeping. He was chilling. Here the, the water's pouring into the boat, and the storm is raging, the wind is howling, and he is, he's just got his head on a pillow, and he's He's asleep. How can Jesus be asleep with all of, this, all of this trouble? How can Jesus be asleep when so much is going wrong? The disciples came and said, Jesus, wake up. Don't you care? We're going to perish. The Bible says that Jesus arose and he rebuked the wind and the waves. He said, peace be still. Everyone say, peace be still. He said, peace be still. And they were amazed that he could control the wind and the waves. But he didn't just do that. He, he gently rebuked them, and he, he, he rebuked them for their lack of faith. He rebuked them for their doubt. He rebuked them. It was a gentle rebuke, 
But nonetheless, it was a rebuke. You shouldn't be so afraid. So the, the biggest part of the story is it, it was not that he would still the storm, but he's trying to calm them down and help them understand, hey, I'm with you. It's going to be okay. And, and I know that if we apply this to us, we could all find ourselves in a situation, or maybe you have, and you're wondering, like, what's going to happen next? And yeah, you have faith in Jesus, and you even pray to Jesus to, to help you, but there's such a lack of faith. And, and I'm not here to get on to you. I'm just, I'm just saying you're not alone. The disciples experienced the same thing. So how can we have the kind of peace that Jesus had? He's chilling. He's got a pillow. He's sleeping right in the middle of the storm. How can we be so relaxed in difficult times like this? How can, how, how can this be? I know that maybe you're incredulous and say, this is impossible. Well, the scripture that I want to share with you today, I think will get us going in the right direction. Let's look at it. It's in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 13. And we're reading from the New Living Translation. It says, and now you've been united with Christ Jesus... Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Look what it says in verse 17. He brought this good news of peace. Notice how this reads, this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Y'all, we have so much at our disposal. We have so much to be thankful for because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, the price that he paid. The good news of peace is available to everyone in this room and to everyone that's watching online. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are in life, you can access this peace. But the only way to have peace with God is that you have to accept the good news of Jesus. You've got to accept. It's, I know that the news is almost too good to be true. Because really, we, truth be told, we, we gravitate towards negative news. We gravitate towards bad news. We turn on the news and it, it, it almost... It, a warm feeling washes over us when we can see how much wrong is going on in our world. I mean, I'm not saying that's true for you, but it seems that's the way it is, that, that the big money comes when we talk about how bad everything is going, and then the sponsors pay for the news, and so that's what the, the news is always going to be negative. It seems like it's always, because we're predisposed to be drawn in and attracted to little nuggets of negativity. To, to just little things that we, you know, someone starts saying, did you hear? Like our ears perk up because we, we kind of like, we, we feed off of the negative. There, there's a scripture, we won't turn there, but it, it's Philippians 4, 8. It says, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So our minds, to have the mind of Christ, we need to focus on things that are worthy of our attention. Things that are good, things that are wholesome. Don't focus on the negative. Don't, you know, if, if you want peace in your life, why would you want to watch three episodes of some kind of horror movie? You know what I mean? It's, it's like we feed on the negative, but yet we hope for the positive. It doesn't work that way. We've got to focus on what is good. Whatever's good, whatever's lovely. Because the negative news in life, the bad news in life, truly affects us physically. It affects us to our core. Our physiological makeup is affected by negative news. The scripture says that a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. The drying of the bones, the cortisol, the stress that's produced actually dries the bone marrow. All of our stem cells come from our bone marrow, right? So one scripture says that a good report makes the bones fat. That's in the King James. Or the marrow of the bone becomes healthy when you take in good news. I'm just saying, when you take in the good news message of Jesus, it will affect you physically and spiritually. So watch out for the bad news and watch out for the fake news. Fake news, by that I mean lies. Satan is the master of deception. He is the father of all lies. He is the author of confusion. And if he can slip in 
some partial truth or some half truth or some lie and get you to the Bible says that he is the God of this world. Satan is the he is the prince and the power there. And the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, so that the light of the good news of Christ will not shine. So ask God to help you discard any half truth or any false information. Help, say, God, help me focus on what is true. Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, I want to think on that. I want to focus on that. I want to meditate on that. And, and of course, you also want to be aware of religious conundrums. A conundrum is this learned helplessness. You know, it's like uh, it, there's a scripture that says that there are those that are ever learning. Oh, they're pouring over the scripture, but they're never able to come to the knowledge of truth. That's a conundrum. Well, you say, I'm trying to study scripture, but you're just studying scripture for, you know, just I'm reading through my daily Bible. Focus on Jesus so that because Jesus is the answer to every question. Uh, a question needs to have an answer, and he is the answer to our questions. When you see a hamster running on the wheel, it's like a learned helplessness. He's not getting anywhere, but the harder he runs, the more he stays in the same place. And he's wondering, what's going on? You're, you're saying, dude, get off the wheel, and you can run through the open fields. Here's another way to describe this learned helplessness or a conundrum is, a, is the, uh, the peace symbol. We see the peace symbol was made famous back in the 60s, and it's really, uh, it's called Nero's Cross or the Broken Jew, and it's a mockery of Jesus. You've seen the bumper sticker, no Jesus, no peace, and then underneath it says, no Jesus, no peace. So no Jesus, N-O, no, if you don't have Jesus, you have no peace. But then if you know Jesus, then you will know peace. So without Jesus, it's impossible to experience this peace with God. When you're, when you're at peace with God, everything is good. When you're at peace with God, you know that God's not against you. He's for you. You can chill. You can relax. You can know that your Heavenly Father loves you and he, he, He's got you. You're going to be okay. You have peace with God. So once you have peace with God, here's my second point. You're going to have peace of mind. Everyone say peace of mind. I didn't say you're going to give someone a piece of your mind. I'm just saying you're going to have peace of mind. In your thoughts, your very thoughts are going to be at peace. Your very thoughts. You know, it's, it's possible for me to look like I'm cool, calm, and collected, but on the inside, I'm, I'm torn up. On the inside, I'm troubled. God is not God's will for you to be torn up or troubled on the inside. For your thoughts to be thoughts of worry and apprehension and anxiety. And you, where, you, where you really literally have to take a pill that will cause you to chill. That's not God's plan for your life. To, to, to live on medication, to, to, to calm your nerves. I believe that through God's word you can find a peace. Matter of fact, in, in Isaiah 26, we won't turn there. It says, that will keep him in perfect peace. Everyone say perfect peace. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is fixed on you. So when we fix our minds on Jesus, it has an effect in our thoughts. Our thoughts are not as troubled. Our thoughts are not as fearful and worried. We're not, we're not so anxious. We're not like, like Jack Handy who, who once said, out of all of my imaginary friends, there's not one that I didn't end up having to kill. Get it? Imaginary friends? Like, come on, you need to think about some other stuff, then you won't be killing all your imaginary friends. He else, he said, you know, there's a pe perfect place. I love to go on my imagination. Perfect vacation spot. Beautiful sand, beautiful beaches, seagulls. But one thing is terrible. He said the flies are terrible there. Well, then once again, that's his imagination. It's possible for your imagination to run wild. You can't let your thoughts run wild. You know what I'm talking about. You, you want to read the Word. You want to focus on Scripture. And sometimes you just go to worst-case scenario. That's the, that's the first thing that hits your mind. And then you follow that, and you think, man, all hope is lost when you chase those thoughts down and you run with it. The Scripture tells us that we're supposed to, to, to cast down imagination and to bring every, cap, every thought into captivity and make our thoughts become submitted to Christ. That's what the Scripture says. To capture every thoughts and submit your thoughts to Christ. So when your thoughts are running wild, you grab those thoughts and say, wait a minute, I don't have the right to think that kind of, that's a negative thought. That thought is not from God. That's not a God idea. That's not something that I should be dwelling on. So God, I, 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 I cast that thought aside or I captivate that thought and I'm going to make that my thoughts become submitted to Jesus Christ. 
John Nash was a distinguished professor at MIT many years ago, and he had these crazy thoughts. He, he saw people that weren't there. He heard voices. And here he is, a distinguished professor, an educator, and he's kind of running off the rails. He doesn't know what's going on. He's, imaginating, he's, he's imagining so much, and he, he was able to diagnose himself. And so he, his thesis was the, the dynamic of human conflict, and he understood that his own thoughts were misplaced, and the hierarchy of his thoughts were running amok. He, everything got equal attention in his mind. Every issue in life had equal attention, and so he wasn't able to categorize those thoughts. It's the same way with a computer virus. When a computer virus is designed, it will slip in and mess up the, the mainframe and the way the computer thinks, and it, it readjusts the hierarchy, and so now there's no main central thought, and, and, and then everything else just runs crazy. We have to contextualize our lives. We have to uh, live with context, if you please. How can I live with context? Schizophrenics are really smarter than you and I. They are, truthfully. They hear more, they see more, they smell more, they take it all in. The problem is context. The hierarchy of thought is, is, is messed up. All data is treated, treated as equal. And so consequently, they live confused and paranoid lives. It's possi possible for us to, to just see everything in life and, and let it be equal, and, and then we fixate on something negative, and that looms large in our mind. The central thought that we need to have in our minds is who we are in Christ. In other words, focus on God's ultimate truth about you. There are partial truths. There are things that are true, but they're not ultimately true. Here's a partial truth. You might be going through something and your, your finances are down. Or maybe your, your health is not what you would like. Or maybe you've lost a loved one. And so that's true. There's a partial truth. The ultimate truth that we need to hold on to is that we are creatures made for eternity. The ultimate truth about you and I is that we're going to live forever. And when we live forever with Jesus, we're going to inherit all things. When we live with, with Jesus forever, we're going to have... It, it's, go, it's going to be an existence beyond anything we could ever imagine. It, it causes the earthly existence to pale in comparison. So, so many times we, get, we become locked in time and we forget about how beautiful eternity is going to be. So God's ultimate truth for you is that He loves you. You're going to live forever with Him. And, and it, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be peace forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I love what it says in Matthew 5, 9. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So if you have peace of mind, certainly you're going to have peace with others. Everyone say peace with others. With some people, there's a, there's a conflict everywhere. There's a conflict at home. There's a conflict on the job. There's a, there's a conflict at church. There's a conflict just everywhere. That's not God's plan for your life, for you to have a war on every front. God wants to bring such a peace in your life where you have peace like Jesus and you just, you're chill like Jesus. You're, you have a calm reserve about you. There's a presence about you. And when people are around you, they, they sense that the Prince of Peace is in your life. And you're able to make peace. Not just speak peace. Not just speak peace over the storm, but actually make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I really believe that that's God's plan for us, and I hope this is helping someone here today that may have been going through some, some rough times, and, and maybe you have some issues, some relational issues. I want to encourage you with God's Word today that you can truly access this peace that I'm talking about, just like Jesus. Here's another point that I want to bring today as I wrap up, and that is that peace and holiness always go together. Peace and holiness always always go together. It's amazing how people can use holiness as an excuse to go to war with someone else. Like a holy war, that's an oxymoron. Holiness and war don't go together. Holiness and peace go together. Under the banner of holiness or under the banner of religion, so many people have died. 195 million people have died because of religious wars. 
Right now, there are 200 to 250, maybe 300,000 Christians being persecuted. Religious persecution. People under the banner of doing something holy for their God are persecuting people that follow Jesus. My wife and I had the honor of going to Istanbul a while back, and we preached and taught in, in, a, in a, some sessions with some Iranian pastors and leaders that were in exile there in Turkey. They had escaped Iran. And so Sonia and I, uh, we were pouring over the scriptures, preparing. We get there, we were blown away by these humble, gracious, God-fearing men and women of God. We felt like they should be teaching us. And so here we are teaching them. And you know, the past few Sundays, I've been boohooing and crying during my preaching. Man, I really cried. I think almost every sermon, I'm like bawling my eyes out, and they're coming up and praying for me. And it's a, I'm just a hot mess. And, but but I'm so, well, Sonny and I are so impacted by their stories and being able to go there and meet them and be a part of their ministry. Before that, just prior to that, but going to Istanbul, Sonny and I had the opportunity of meeting a couple that were from Iran and went through that same process, escaped, went to uh, Turkey, pastored in Turkey, Elam Ministries sent them to Turkey and then sent them to the United States. And there's a baptism picture. They were in this baptism. There are thousands and thousands of Christians uh, now that are people converting to Christianity in Islam, in in Iran. Iranian Islamic people are becoming Christians, being baptized. Well, Nikki and Sharam, this great couple, that we become friends with. They live in Houston. They were in our small group Bible study. They worship with us. They uh, are heroes of the faith. And what I'm so excited to tell you today is that they have driven up from Houston and they are with us this morning. And I want to introduce them to you. And we are, we are, we are, honored, we are honored to have you all here with us today. And um, I, we're, we're going to interview them and let you kind of hear their story. So we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, this is Sharam and Nikki and Elia and Elisha are in kids ministry right now. So you're going to want to meet them all after church. So go ahead, Sonia. I just, am I open? Yeah. Okay. I just want to echo the sentiments. They're family to us, and we're so thrilled to have them. And I just believe... The blood of Jesus Christ and the word of their testimony is doing something in the spiritual world today. I just know that unbelievable things are happening just just here today. So I, I just felt like I needed to say that. But just to jump right in, Sharam, I want you to tell us what your lifestyle was like in Iran before Jesus. What was your occupation? Just give us a little bit about okay. your life. Uh, I want to say hello for everybody. Uh, I want to say I'm sorry is my English is not very well, but I pray after that service, no headache come with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm master electrician in Iran, and my wife is a graphic designer. I'm not in Iran, not rich, I'm not poor, but I have an easy life. And I have anything I wanted, I have it in Iran. And do you want to say something? Okay. So, so, okay, so we know that Iran is an Islamic state. What were your beliefs uh, before you found Christ? To, what was your life like uh, religiously? Okay, I'm, I'm born as Muslim. Uh, after 16 years old, I think 16 years old, I a lot of pray to that guys, that God, but never give me answer. And I have everything, but I doesn't have a peace. I didn't have a peace. Thank you for my translation. <laughs> and every time I'm empty, I was empty before belief to Jesus. So we we know your story, but we want you to share with the audience, Nikki, what was your marriage like uh, before Jesus? And then when did you meet Jesus? And and just tell us that story. Uh, When I, uh, my husband, when my husband and I met each other, he asked me, do you love, uh, do you like Islam? And I, that time I really hate Islam. And I said, no, I don't like it. And he said, me too. 
and do you want to go to church and uh, Armenian church and see what they believe? And we uh, try to go in there, but they didn't let us uh, to go in there because the government said, don't let Muslim come to your church. And uh, this was Ar Armenian church, right? Yes, okay. Armenian church. And after we married, married uh, my husband uh, uh, really, uh, he was a good liar. And good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and he told me many, many lies about himself, even his age. He said, I'm a few years older than you, but he, was, he is a few years younger than me. And many things else. And when but I, right now, she's younger than me, yes? <laughs> she, she looks younger. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I decided we had many problems. I had uh, many problems with my personality too, and we didn't have any peace in uh, our life, and uh, we just argue, and I decided to divorce. And after one year, and at the same time, uh, I decided to divorce. His dad uh, was another city, and it was uh, 14, it is 14 hours far from my city. And he asked me to go to funeral and after you can divorce. And I said, okay, we went there and uh, we met a young man as age as uh, my husband. And he came to us and said, do you know your dad was Christian and he was um, praying for you all every day and he wished you believe to Jesus and because Jesus can change your life, your personality. And he asked us, do you want to try this God? This God? Do you want to know about him? And we said yes. And he gave us a Bible and CD about Jesus. When we drive back home in the car, we read, that, I read those books. And, but separately, Holy Spirit touched both of us. And... When we came back home, it was 2 a.m., and he asked me, uh, do you want to uh, try this God? And he said, I can change your life. I, can, I, I will be with you in, in your whole life. And I said, yes, I want. And both of them knelt down and prayed and gave our heart to Jesus. Well, this Uh, Sharon, we know it's illegal to convert um, to Christianity from being, being a Muslim. It's also illegal to share your faith or to be a part of any kind of an underground church. How did your conversion or your decision to become a Christian, how that, did that affect you? What did the government do? What, tell us about that. After a few years, we believed to Jesus. Uh, we have a good group in and I have a home church, and government know he asked me and put in the jail, me and my wife. I for 73 days. Put you in jail? Yes, put, in jail. put in the jail. 73 days I in the solitary room. Solitary it, confinement. Yes, and government hit me a lot, broke my back, and I lost my job because he took my store, my office, everything. I lost everything. I lost my family. After jail, I go to Turkey. We pastor for Turkey for two years. We had a very hard time. But that is a very hard time for me and my family. What is God give us peace? Because and we touch God, and God and God is touch us. Hmm. In the jail, government tell me you come back to Islam, and he said I give you back everything, and I help you. I give you money, I give you everything. I say no, I didn't come back to Islam because that God, that God, give me peace. 
But is Islam doesn't have any peace, doesn't have any love. Is God is Islam is all the time is angry. <laughs> I don't like that God. I find my God. Because if somebody is thirsty, he can find a water. I find a water, I find a real water. How to change it? And I stay with God. I want to tell you something about Stephen. Stephen? Stephen. Stephen. Yeah. Stephen. Sorry, my English <laughs> is bad. Is Stephen in the Act, chapter 7, 55? Stephen, stay for God. Stand for God. Stand for God. And Jesus stand for Stephen. If you read all the Bible, every time said Jesus in the right seat in the right side of the Father. Here said Jesus stand up in the right side of the Father. Jesus stand up for Stephen because Stephen stand up for or st stop stood, stand, stand up. stood up for God. God. So good. So basically, you're saying that because of What's given you peace is that you read that, saw how Stephen stood for God in the midst of persecution. And while he's being stoned, he saw Jesus stand at the right hand of the Father. Yes. Every other time in Scripture, he's sitting. And so what you described to us earlier is that you sense that when you stand for God, God's going to stand for yes. you. Yes. And, uh, sorry, uh, when, uh, when I decide to stay with uh, Shahram, um, I decide to surrender all my life to Jesus, and not just part of that. I didn't want to be uh, people in the world. And Jesus, uh, God says, uh, be holy like me, and I will be with you. And really, he did for us. We didn't just read this Bible, we lived this Bible. Re we really saw all this in this Bible, we experienced it. And that's why we didn't want to deny Jesus. Because we lived with him and we saw every, every, every verse. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes, that's why we wanted to be with Jesus with all problems. He was with us. He is with us. And we taste him. Wow. Before Sonia asks a question, not only did they threaten to take your lives or to kill you, they also promised maybe money, right? So back and forth, the, prom, they, the, uh, the government yes. say either deny Jesus or we'll kill you, deny Jesus, and we can give you money. Right? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, I know in the last service, uh, people were asking, and I, I think we have time to do this here, but just some people were wanting to know the process of how did you get out of prison. Can you tell us a little bit about, Nikki, uh, we know you were in, in jail for 73 days. How long were you in, in jail? I was just one day uh, and I re released from jail at 3 a.m. And it's an released. unbelievable. Released from yeah. prison. Okay. And it was just miracle. It's a, a lot, a long story. I cannot tell all of them, but it was really uh, miracle. And uh, okay, what did you say? Uh, just so you were released, and it was a miraculous release. Did did God send someone to release you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's long. Um, okay. I have my oldest son. He was um, one and a half, one year when they took us to jail and um, I gave my son to mother-in-law he lives she lives with us we had a third floor apart uh, third floor apartment yes, yes. and she lived um, the second floor and when they came to our house and arrested us I just gave my son to my mother-in-law and they took us to jail and when we went there, I was, uh, we saw many Christians there. And I started to pray to God and said, you, you know, they asked me, do you know you will be killed if you, know, if you don't deny Jesus? Uh, if you deny and come back to Islam, we won't kill you. And we could help you to have good life again. 
And uh, what we said, no, they put us in a solitary. And I was praying there and, um, about, and I said, God, you know, I never deny you, uh, but I cannot tell you lie. You know my heart. I'm, was, I'm, I'm worried for my son. I know he needs me. He is crying now. Yeah, and uh, please, uh, uh, you told us if you love anybody more than me, you cannot follow me. And you know I'm right now worried for my son. And I was talking to God, and I said uh, some place like that, and I was playing, and I saw a vision, and I saw uh, Shahram, but a guy came to my room, and sent me out of jail and I uh, didn't know this I didn't know what's that and I stand up and said what happened I did, I was sleeping I was praying I'm not sleeping what was that and God talked to my heart and said Nikki you have to know Ilya is my son and I gave it to you you cannot take care of him you have to surrender your son too and I um, again surrender. Yes, yes sorry, yes. sorry. Surrender him to me, and I cry and say sorry. Yes, I have to give it to you. And when I give Ilya to God, I saw the door was open, and Shahram and that guy came to my room, and that uh, it was two or three a.m. And he does he didn't know how, but he sent me out of jail. And tomorrow that Shahram said when they came to jail and say, where is Nikki? And they said, we don't know. They fight into each other. And Shahram said, all Christians scared. And they said, they will kill us because they were so angry. And they didn't know how I got out. Wow. <clears throat> yes, I want to tell you something. Is it God? Is Jesus name? In the Bible is Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Uh, one month ago, I go to San Antonio. I want to go see an, another cave. Is younger my son with me, and we with younger with younger my son. I go to cave, and my son is two years old. He said, "Oh, Dad, I'm so scared here." I say, "Don't scare because I'm here. I'm with you," and God. I remember this God said, Emmanuel, Emmanuel is God with you. Why are you scared? Sometimes it's bad happen. Sometimes it's life is hard. Sometimes you see a storm. But don't worry. Just need your focus in the God. Because God with us all the time. In the boat, is Pastor Simeon preach, is God, with, is Jesus with the student. What is the focus for your student? Not in the Jesus. In the way, in the storm, in the water, and scared. Sometimes in the life, me or everybody, is a focus go to a storm for life. Need to change my thing and need a back focus to God. And you see is God with us. Because he's Emmanuel. Emmanuel. We want to give um, we want to give everyone a chance to maybe recommit their heart to Jesus. You know, after hearing a story like that, you know, I feel like I want to raise my hand too. Like I, I feel like I've been a baby Christian most of my life, and I want to grow in Christ. And um, so I know first service we did this. We'll do this today. If you want to recommit your life to Jesus, you're a believer, but you just want to be all in, or maybe it's your first time, I want you to raise your hand. And Sharam's going to pray for you in Farsi, and, she's, and Nikki's going to interpret. So anyone in the room, just raise your hand and say, I want to be all in. I want to recommit my life to Jesus. There's one hand, two hands. I, got, I mean, wow, this is better than first service. Wow, amazing. Sharam and Nikki stand once you pray. 
My Heavenly Father, خداوندو در این ساعت به نام ایسای مسیح روح مقدس تو بریزه تو این مکان God please I ask you to give your Holy Spirit to all of us this place با تمام وجود احساس کنیم روح قدوس تو را we want to touch we want you to touch us and we feel it تو ای خداوند به ما قدرت و قوت بده اونطوری که تو میخوای زندگی کنیم Please give us your power uh, to live like to live like you و یادمون بده که فوکوسمون به تو باشه And every time remind us to focus on you not the problems مرسی برای همه چی خدامونو به دستان مقدس تو میسپاریم آمین Thank you for everything you did for us and you will do for us. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen.